the you know last year 18,000 attendees. And of course, it's it's extremely helpful uh, that some of our own, both faculty and students, can go and attend this event. And the the best way to do it is through uh, scholarships and fellowships. And of course, these fellowships cost money, and we we want to send uh, you know this year. Uh, a larger number of students, 15 students and two faculty there, and uh, our don or the donations that we receive from our industry sponsors um, partially actually go to fund this. So um, thank you very much, and um, you know, hopefully you, you really also feel, feel good about uh, improving the, or, or, or supporting, helping, uh, helping us uh, improve diversity in computer science, because it's clearly very important, um, a very important topic, and you know, on our way to get parity of, of female and male computer scientists. And you know, when you look at some of the quotes, I think it's, it's very impactful for everybody who, who attends that. So thank you very much for that. All right, so um, just quick, quick information about Capstone for those who don't know. So we have now the, the Capstone Project competition. Capstone Projects are um, teams of students. We have 11 teams of four or five students who worked for two quarters a long time together with their industry mentors to um, help build something new, something that is not written in a textbook, something that is a real industry problem. So it's really something that is, you know, unusual and very different from a normal curriculum where, you know, you get a textbook, you just learn it, you go to exam, you do the exam, hopefully you do well, you get an A, you go out, get out of here. So I think it's, it's different in the sense that it really helps you solve and see how it is later when you have to solve real world problems and there is no known solution. So this is, a, I think, awesome. It's a challenging project. Uh, teams have worked a lot and they are very, I think, happy and proud to show, show you their results today. Um, we also turned this into a competition. We have some judges here from industry and academia. Thank you very much for helping us out, uh, who will judge those projects based on, you know, their relevance, impact, quality, and, and of course, how the presentation goes. And we'll have some prizes, 2000 for the team who wins the first, uh, 1500 for the second, and 500 for the third prize, which, uh, you know, is, I think, a, a nice recognition uh, of the work you've done. Here is just a, a list of, of the teams. Um, we'll have, as I said, 11 presentations with their corporate sponsors. Um, and, um, you know, you will see, see their work in, in what is essentially uh, 10 minutes presentations that hopefully cover the basic idea of, uh, you know, they, they, they try to solve the basic problem they tried to solve and how they went about. And, uh, you know, of course, also these capstone presentations are, are only possible because we have a, a number of excellent companies, um, many of them local, that sponsor these competitions that take time where their employees serve as mentors to their teams and that meet uh, over, you know, a period of six months, often, you know, weekly or more than once a week with their teams to help them succeed. So um, I think it's, it's a great event. We're very proud to have that. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to the presentations in the next two and a half hours. All right, just a couple of other notes. Uh, you know, we have also in the afternoon the graduate student distinguished lectures, which is, um, you know, research, exciting research in our opinion, um, presented by some of our graduate students. Um, I hope we have some diverse set of topics from more theoretical to systems topics, from AI, data science, to... Um, something that is in computer security. Um, we picked five of a, of a pool of submissions. So our graduate students, of course, they are used to that. Um, they have to submit their work, gets rejected many times, um, but sometimes you also get accepted. You get an, a, a paper accepted at the conference or you have a talk accepted here at the graduate student distinguished lectures. And uh, we will also award the best three presentations, some prizes as well. And, um, you know, again, we'll, we'll draw on a panel of, of judges to, to help us do that. All right, and finally, um, there is the distinguished lecture. Uh, it's David Culler uh, from UC Berkeley, a very well-known um, person in systems, um, has done a lot of excellent work. Um, as you can see already from the title, it sounds uh, somewhat interesting, right? What, what, what is this? Network systems designed for sustainability in the built environment. So if you want to find out, you've got to join us for the invited lecture. Uh, for the distinguished lecture late in the afternoon. And uh, what is interesting, we tried this uh, last quarter and it worked quite well. We also want to uh, continue with the idea of a fireside chat where basically um, David will chat with a couple of our faculty members uh, less about 
his research and his work, but more about the person behind the research. How did he get into research? What does he see in maybe, you know, things that are not strictly related to IoT systems and the operating system that he builds for that. So um, I think it's a, an interesting different view on the person rather than just the work that, of course, he will, will tell you all about in his keynote. All right. And before I end, I just want to um, highlight a, yet another event, a side event that is going on today, which is the ICTF, the International Capture the Flag competition, which um, is something that uh, my colleague Giovanni is organizing, has organized since essentially 2001, where you have um, teams all over the world from different universities um, trying to hack each other in real time while the competition is going on, while at the same time trying to defend their own machine from being compromised. Um, and of course, you know, it's not like in the movie where weird stuff is happening in a graphics way. Uh, real world security and hacking is maybe less exciting to watch when you're doing it itself, but I think it's exciting to watch the scoreboard and the action that is going on at the global level. So you can basically go there, it's in the flying A room, uh, which, oh, actually that should be food hub, sorry. The food hub, not the good hub, it's maybe the good food hub. So you have to basically go out around, there's the food hub, and then you have to walk over to the, towards the bookstore, and on that hallway, there is a room that is called the flying A room, and they've set it up, there are all these machines, you'll see a lot of flying stuff going back and forth like in the movies, but there's actually real world hacking behind it and we'll have, last year I think there were 280 teams all over the world that were playing. So if you want to check it out, just walk over and it uh, should, be, should be fun and interesting. All right, with that, um, you know, basically uh, the only thing that's left uh, before we ask our first team, Capstone team is um, to thank you for coming and uh, wish you a great summit. Hopefully you enjoy the event. Hopefully you can stay with us for, for most of the day or just you know, come in and out. And um, yeah, thank you very much. All right, so first capstone team, I think we're uh, Bob's builders. Um, Both mics are on. Uh, here's the laser pointer. And, um... okay. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here. My name is Kevin. To my left, we have Sean, and to my right, we have Jimmy, Sam, and Natasha. Together, we are Bob's Builders, and for the last six months, we've had the honor and privilege to work with Procore. So first off, the presentation went down, and uh, second off, what is Procore? All right, so what is Procore? Procore is all about building software solutions to the construction industry. More specifically, they provide the world with the most widely used construction management software in the world. Right? With their software tools, Procore's clients are able to manage their construction projects, ensure proper quality and safety, monitor the company's finances, and maximize productivity. Ultimately, Procore, when what they do can be boiled down to a single statement, Procore builds the software that builds the world. So Procore collects a ton of data about how and how much their clients use Procore's tools. Right? As you guys can see, we have eight terabytes of currently stored user analytic data, and every single month we see over 400 gigabytes of new user analytic data. And so this data includes things like, for example, the number of documents or blueprints a client may upload, the number of times any specific user might log into their system, or maybe the number, that amount of activity a specific project gets versus another uh, construction project, for example. And so now we're going to go into our philosophy. We know Procore has all of this data, 
right? And we believe that data that's well visualized and presented in a clear, coherent manner can help drive new and powerful insight and knowledge. Construction managers and other company leaders can use this newfound insight and knowledge to help drive action and make smarter, data-driven decisions. And so now we're gonna get into a little bit of the problem, right? And ironically enough, Procore's main problem is actually their current solution. So now let's say I'm one of Procore's clients and I want to know some specific piece of information about my company. For example, maybe the, num the most active construction project I have going on, right? How the process works currently is that I would have to call into Procore, talk to one of their employees, and explain to them exactly what I want. From then, I would have to wait for them to figure out how to get this information, get this data, turn it into a graph, visualize it in some way that makes it easy to understand. And here's the worst part. Next, they'll have to screenshot that graph or table or chart or whatever they made for me, take that JPEG image, and then send it back to me in an email. And so you can imagine that is really, really slow and inefficient. Let's say maybe there was a misunderstanding in what I wanted and what I got back is not exactly what I wanted. I would have to go through this process again and wait up to 24, 48 hours just to get this p basic piece of information about my company, right? And so the main issue comes from the fact that this data, which could be really valuable to Procore's clients, is really hard to access and takes a long time to do so, right? And without easy access, this potentially valuable information is wasted. And so now I'm gonna pass it over to Sean to talk about our solution and what we came up with to help overcome that problem. <clears throat> right, so as Kevin was saying earlier, what Procore currently has to do, it's a, it's a bit slow, it's a bit archaic, and it can be kind of tedious to have to email back and forth. What they want to do is put the power into the hands of the client. The client shouldn't have to go through this sort of um, back and forth with Procore, they should be able to make the charts themselves, right? And they should be able to know what's going on within their company. And that'd be a lot better for them. So they can um, arrange the charts in any way they like, and also they wouldn't have to go through the same process again if they want to make like a little change. So now we're going to be going straight into our demo. So what we have is a simple dashboard answers a few common questions. What are the most active projects um, within our company? What tools are being used the most? And, well, I forgot the last one, but um, we will definitely answer that question. So after this, um, quick little hiccup, we are going to go into our demo. Apologies for all the technical difficulties. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here's the dashboard that we have for the demo currently, and the three questions were like, what are the most um, active projects, what are the most active tools, and what's the most popular platform? So you can see here we have different charts that sort of demonstrate that. Um, on the top left, we have the top 10 projects, and we see, okay, Eastern Bayer Academy is using Procore the most, and here, Drawing Log seems to be the most used tool, and then here we can see the different platforms. So, um, kind of got like an interesting distribution here. iOS seems to be about half of what's inside our company, right? But let's say we really want to start pushing Procore's projects, um, right? And we really want to make things a little bit more competitive. So we decide, okay, we want to have like a little competition within our company. And whoever's using Procore the most gets like a $5,000 bonus check or something, right? So in order to figure out who's the most active employee within our company, we're going to need a new question. So we go ahead and click that, and what this is going to allow us to do is make this new chart. So there's a couple ways we can go about this. Um, one, we can click the new question button, where we can use drop-down menus in order to make a query to make our graph, or two, we can just do a native query. So let's say we're just like a mega superpower user and we know SQL, then we can type in our query and then generate the chart from that. 
Uh, personally, I'm not too good with SQL, so we're going to go ahead and stick with the question builder. So first, we'll go ahead and select our table, and then we'll get answered just to see what's inside. And this is all of the data that we have in our database. So each row is one event, and the different columns are the different attributes of the event. So we can see like platform, uh, the domain, and so on and so forth. But it's not quite telling us yet um, who's the most active user, right? So we need a group by. So we want to group by the user email address. We'll go ahead and click that. And now we see all the different uh, employees within our company, but we don't really know who's the most active yet. So what we need to do is, instead of viewing the raw data, look at the count of the rows. OK, so now we can see how many events each user has generated. But it, it's still a bit unclear. It's, it's still a little hard to see, OK, who's the most active, right? So we can change our visualization from a table to a row chart. And once we do that, it's looking a little better, a little easier to understand, but still a bit messy, a bit disorganized. So from here, what we need to do is sort of um, sort the data <coughs> according to the number of events descending, because this is a top 10 chart. And that looks a lot better, but we can reduce it even further and just limit the rows to 10. OK, cool. So this is sort of the chart that we want to have. We're very pleased with this, so we're going to go ahead and save it. And then we name it whatever we want, maybe top 10 employees. OK, and then Metabase will ask us, do you want to save it to a dashboard? Yes, please. And now the chart appears within the dashboard we had earlier. We can go ahead and resize it into a way we like. And once we're pleased with the dashboard, we'll go ahead and save. And now we have the updated dashboard. So once you get pretty good at this, um, you can add all kinds of different charts. Um, and that's sort of what we've done for the uh, default dashboard we envisioned for each of the companies. So we can see different things like, OK, what are the best uh, tools on mobile specifically? Who's uh, doing super well with Procore on mobile? And yeah, from this, we can generate a lot of different insights, right? So <clears throat> let's say um, we can see OK, like South Tennessee Institute, maybe they're not doing so well with Procore tools. Maybe we should go and talk to them, and maybe we can offer them more training so that they can be more familiar with the tools that they have. Or if we scroll down, we can see, OK, uh, mobile usage seems to be a lot higher than our web browser usage. Maybe instead of investing in more company laptops, we can invest in more company phones, and specifically iPhones, right? because iOS seems to be the most popular platform. So that's sort of how we're turning our insights into actions as a manager of a company. So now we'll go back to our presentation. Right, and as Kevin was saying before, we take all the data that's available to us within our company, and we turn that into insights so that we can actually understand what's going on inside. And from there, we can have data-driven decisions that allow us to become more efficient and effective at what we do. So that's the end of our presentation. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, all of the dashboards and charts that you see within the dashboard are updated in real time, or you can set it to be you know, any time period that you want. Five seconds, five minutes, five hours, whatever you want. So ultimately, what's kind of behind the scenes, we, uh, it's abstracted out as a form of a question, but really what it is is a SQL query. Right? You see all these drop-down menus and all these options, but ultimately that becomes a uh, convert it into a SQL query, which helps us, and we use a tool to help us convert that into a visualization. Good. Any other questions? All right. Thanks. Again. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.
shooters. This is somewhat stably stuck in, so you can, it doesn't fall out. Audio? Audio as well. Audio. We need audio for this one, right? Okay. And, uh, guys, I'll give you a, a counter there, 10 minutes, so you can see that cool. as well. Thank you. Yeah. Alright, next up, shoot farms. It's just working, right? No. Did you, still did, you change, did you change the sound now, okay? If you need a sound here, right? Just... Okay. <coughs> you even made the sound, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were hitting it the laptop with mid time, right? It made yeah. the sound, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so definitely the sound seems to be working. All right, hello everyone. We're Shoot Farms, and we partner with Invoca for our capstone project. So I'm sure many of you have heard of Siri, Alexa, and Cortana, but today we're here to introduce you to Pam, our personalized appointment manager. So small businesses face a lot of problems today. One problem is that answering the phone distracts employees from what they should be doing. In fact, just last week, I was at the barber shop and I noticed one of the barbers had to stop cutting a customer's hair just to go answer the phone. I'm sure many of you would find that annoying. And it's situations like this that can lead customers to take their business elsewhere. And that's only part of the problem. Another problem is that, um, excuse me, small businesses simply aren't answering their phones. In fact, about 60% of phone calls to small businesses either go completely unanswered or go directly to voicemail. This is causing small businesses to lose or miss out on a lot of customers. So what is the answer to all these problems? Some would say that the answer is to simply hire a secretary. But the problem with that is secretaries make 
about $34,000 a year, while the average small business only makes about $75,000 a year. So obviously, this would simply not be feasible for most small businesses. So if secretaries aren't the answer, then what is? So the good news is that we've come up with a solution to all these problems. So if you didn't catch it at the beginning, PAM stands for Personalized Appointment Manager. Once PAM is integrated with your business, PAM will be able to assist customers who call on your business by completely handling the appointment scheduling process and answering questions about your business. This allows you to spend your valuable time on your actual business and with the customers right in front of you instead of on the phone. So this leads me to availability. PAM is able to take calls from your customers 24-7, 365 days a year. Whether you're currently too busy to pick up the phone or your business is closed for the day, PAM will continue to take calls and manage appointments for you. So PAM also provides extensibility above and beyond that of a single secretary. If multiple customers call in at the same time, PAM will be able to handle each one of them simultaneously. So we estimate the cost of PAM to handle calls for a single small business to be around $7.50 a month, just $90 a year. This is just a fraction of the $34,000 annual salary of a standard secretary. So we know that PAM will save you time and money as a business, but how does PAM improve the customer experience? Before we answer that question, let's see PAM in action with a brief demo. Oh man, we're out of paper. Hello, thank you for calling Dunder Mifflin. This is Pam. How can I help you today? Hi Pam, I'd like to schedule an appointment this Friday for 3 p.m. so we can talk paper. Let me check to see if that time is open. That time is unavailable. However, we have openings at 2 o'clock p.m. and 4 o'clock p.m. Would either of these times work? 4 p.m. would be preferred. Your appointment is scheduled for Friday, March 16th at 4 o'clock p.m. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for calling Dunder Mifflin. Goodbye. So how does PAM benefit the customer? As you just saw in the demo, PAM is a hassle-free experience. The frustrating press one for this, press two for that, automated telephone system is replaced with a simple conversation. Now, you just ask the information you need. PAM will always be ready to not only answer a question, but also schedule, update, or cancel appointment. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever called in the business and been sent to a voicemail? Well, worry not. PAM will always be there to answer your call. Furthermore, you will never be put on hold because PAM can serve multiple customers at once. And once you made your appointment, you can be rest assured that PAM will correctly schedule an appointment through a text message with the date and time. Integrating with PAM is an equally seamless process for a business client. Employees can log into our site, which will display a personalized business dashboard where they can view all appointments scheduled by PAM. Employees can also set up and update business information such as location and operating hours. After updating your business profile, PAM will automatically configure and communicate that information with your customer. So now you know what PAM can do, but how exactly does PAM work? That's a great question, Yuki. So PAM is actually composed of two separate applications that were built using these various technologies. One is a web application for our business dashboard, and the other is a Sinatra server that processes, processes and handles customer phone calls. So this is a simplified overview of PAM's architecture, and at a high level what happens is businesses will register on our, on our website and will store their information in our database. Next, when a customer calls in, Twilio will answer the phone and provide PAM with the transcription of the conversation. In our natural language processing stage, PAM will parse this transcription using a decision tree to determine the customer's intent. If it's determined that a customer would like to schedule an appointment, PAM will detect the date and time the customer would like and then send that information to Google Calendar for automatic scheduling. For other general purpose inquiries, PAM will provide Twilio with a text response, which it can then convert into speech. So PAM, PAM is built using Docker, which allows us to uh, run on any platform and scale to meet any sort of business need. PAM is currently hosted on Heroku, 
but we could easily migrate Pam to another cloud solution provider such as AWS or Microsoft's Azure. Now you might be wondering, what does the future have in store for Pam? So in its current state, Pam can be a great asset to any small business. However, we see a lot of potential to take Pam to the next level, as well as establish a high level of customer retention. One of the first things we like to flesh out is personalization, <clears throat> such that each business's unique personality can shine through Pam. From different voices, accents, and languages, we want Pam to be as accessible as possible. We also think it'd be really cool to allow for custom greetings that incorporate company slogans. Finally, by adding support for frequently asked questions, we could streamline the most common customer phone calls. So right now, Pam is fairly passive. Only when our customer calls in, Pam takes action. But we would like Pam to be a lot more proactive. In the days leading up to an appointment, we want to send a text message reminder to our customer, reminding them of their upcoming appointment. These reminders have shown to reduce customer no-shows by up to 30%, which is especially valuable to a small business because it increases the likelihood of that appointment turning into a real sale. And after an appointment has been completed, we'd once again like to reach out to that customer for feedback as a way of establishing customer trust and loyalty. We also see an opportunity here to inject ads in conversation. So say a customer calls into a salon to get their hair done. Pam could suggest a package deal with the massage as well. In this way, Pam has a direct impact on revenue. Finally, by adding an analytics arm to Pam, we could provide insight on how to make your business a lot more efficient. By looking at phone calls, we could determine the optimal schedule, focus on peak hours, and avoid any lulls in customer traffic. And if a customer calls in for an appointment during a high traffic time, we could direct them to an appointment during a lighter period so that walk-in customers also have a satisfactory experience. Um, and then by looking at the rate of appointments, we could even determine how many employ employees would be needed to run your business on any given day. So all these features would really help a business maximize its profitability. So we're really stoked with all that Pam has to offer. And before we wrap up, we'd like to give a special shout out to Peter, Jesse, Mike, Nick, and the team at Invoca for their support, guidance, code reviews, and LaCroix. Thank you. And thank you all for your time today. We look forward to having Pam answer your call soon. in and doesn't move because we had some challenges here. There will be a timer shown. Already? All right, match folio from up folio. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Simon. To my right, I have Michael, Keith, uh, Chantel, and Peter. And we are Matchfolio. For our capstone present or project, we decided to team up with Appfolio to streamline the process of uh, applying for a lease. So to start off, could I get a show of hands? How many of you guys out there have had to sign a lease before? 
So basically all of us. And I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with the super annoying process of trying to lock lease down. Uh, personally, I have lived in Isla Vista for four years, and each year I have lived at a different place. Uh, so each time I had to go through the tedious process of figuring out which, or which properties were available for the upcoming school year, then figuring out how to apply to these places, then filling out lengthy application forms, paying pricey application fees, um, going through background checks and paying for those as well, only to find out that at the end of the day, the property I was hoping to get was given away to someone else. Um, so another issue that I think we have not run into is the problem of thinking that you found the perfect place to live only to realize later on that you're not qualified to live there. What I mean by that is property managers sometimes run background checks on prospective tenants and that background check can come back with things like your credit score isn't high enough or you don't make enough money or you have a couple felonies on your record. Just some small things like that that can disqualify you from living at a place. So with Matchfolio, we hope to eliminate that issue along with all the other inconveniences that come with trying to find a lease. Test? Okay. So how do we come over overcome these issues? Well, our team Matchfolio has created a housing search mobile app that allows users to like or dislike properties that are filtered by their preferences and pre-approved by their background check score. Information provided to the users is based off of uploads from property management. By condensing all these property listings into one app, Matchfolio removes the need to go to different property management websites and tediously check off specific information users would want to see in their potential housing. To name a few of those preferences, those include amenities, rent, range of rent, and location. We also are introducing or using a common rental application uh, questions so that we avoid redundancy when applying to multiple <clears throat> properties. Another issue that prospective tenants face is obtaining a background check. As Simon previously mentioned, your qualification to live at a place is contingent on your background check score, which you won't know the result of until after you've applied. So to combat this, we are introducing a universal background check, which is paid in one set fee and can be used in multiple properties on across all Appfolio property managements. So with your background check score, we assure that every property that you're looking at is something that you're qualified for. And with your preferences, that it's something that you're interested in as well. All right, and with that, we're just going to walk you through how easy it can be to sign up for this app and use it in its full duration. So let's go, we'll, we'll pretend we're signing up as a new user. Okay. Um, who better to sign up as than Mr. Meeseeks? <laughs> Definitely not that, we'll try that again. Okay. <laughs> Can you hold on to this, sorry. <laughs> Super secure password. I hit the button twice. All right, and like that, we signed up and logged in. Okay, so the first time you sign, in, uh, sign up and log into the app, you're gonna have to do the most things that you'll ever have to do. And in part, um, what you do is you sign up using your background information and you fill out your personal information. So right here, this is Mr. Meeseek's personal information. For the sake of demo, um, we went ahead and pre-filled this out. So we'll save that. And next, this is your rental application page. This is what makes our app so nice, is you only have to fill this out once. Although it may be tedious the first time, you only do it once and in one place and you're good to go after that. So let's pretend we fill this all out, boom, 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 and submit. At this point, we're using decision-based screening to run a background check um, based on all the things that Simon and Chantel mentioned. So once that is complete, you're presented uh, with our home screen and basically um, the app, how you're gonna interact with it. Before I get started on 
the picture, I'll show you the top left corner, you have a drawer navigator that can take you back to that personal section we just filled out and the rental app page, as well as a preferences page. This preferences page allows you to choose what you want in a house, whereas the background check says, okay, are you qualified for this? So in a way we're saying, look, we're only gonna show you places that not only you would be interested in, but also places that you're eligible for, pre-qualified for. So like that, we're presented with this property and it's gonna be a bunch of other properties consecutively. And how it works is, if you're interested, you're gonna swipe right, like this. If you're not interested, you're gonna swipe left. Um, if you wanna make your decision based off of simply one picture, you can go ahead and do that. I disadvise doing that. Mike here has had some experiences in a different but similar app and he'll tell you about that later. <laughs> but um, so anyways, if you wanna see some more photos, you can click on it, see its location, you can check out some more um, uh, photos, you can see what it offers, what kind of amenities, and you can even contact the owner. But at this point, um, it's strictly about finding places you're interested in. It's very spontaneous. If you're trying to find a lease quickly, you can do that easily. And it's just, it's all made to be simplified because this process is so tedious. So I'll hand it over to Mike and let him tell you about the rest of the app. Okay, cool. So. <laughs> Um, if I'm using the app, right off the bat, I already know I can only afford houses that are maximum 2500 a month. So I'm going to go ahead and set my well, preference. Mr. Meeseeks can only afford houses that are... <laughs> right, Mr. Meeseeks. Anyway, so I set my preferences to a maximum uh, rent price, and then I'll go ahead back to the home screen. And now I'm presented with houses that are only, uh, at most, 2500 a month. So I can just go ahead and look at them. Um, this one doesn't look too great. Uh, this house looks pretty nice. I'll swipe right on that. This kitchen looks really nice. Uh, I don't like the look of this, so I'm going to swipe left. And this one looks pretty good as well, so I'm just going to hit swipe right. So now that I've swiped um, and indicated my interest on a couple of properties, I can go ahead and head over to these matched properties page. Um, and what this is is just a list of the properties that you've indicated that you're interested in. So you can <laughs> reference back here, um, you can go ahead and click on them to come back to this information page. Uh, scroll through a couple of the pictures to refresh yourself. And at this point, there are um, options to either apply to the property or unmatch from it. So for example, I can go back to this property and it looks a little bit too expensive. I can just unmatch right away. Um, Additionally, we can go over to this map view and it'll show us um, where the properties are with relative, relative to our location. So I can go ahead and see this pin is a little far. This one looks uh, pretty close to campus. So I can go ahead and tap that. Come back to this information page and now at this point I'm interested in this property and I would like to apply. Just go ahead and hit the, the apply. And that will go ahead and send your application over to the property manager, that single application that you had to fill out one time, and you can reuse it. So if I went back to my listings, now it indicates that I've applied to this property. Additionally, just for ease, if I wanted to apply to this one as well, I can just go ahead and swipe apply, and I've applied to both of these properties. And then at this point, the rest of the transaction would take place off app, and you would handle the rest of it uh, outside the app with a property manager. All right. Thank you, Michael and Keith. In the future, we'd like to offer groups of prearranged roommates the option to search for houses together, viewing their properties and matched, or excuse me, their matched properties and preferences. For roommates who have not met each other yet and are still looking for housemates, we'd like to offer a users matching uh, function in which users will be, able to, will be able to swipe on each other based on their pref preferences and matched properties. And because we know millennials don't like to use the phone for calling, we will need to provide a messaging function. We'd like to enable landlords to indicate on a calendar for users to book tours automatically. And for users who are dissatisfied with the current properties that they're being shown, perhaps due to a low credit score, we'd like to enable them to use an optional guarantor to increase their tenant rating. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you, everyone. Any questions?
Um, so for just yeah, she was in line first. Just, yeah, we have, no, go okay. Um, so for the purposes of our project, that Folio provided us with just like a raw JSON uh, text file filled with properties that they have dealt with before, and we were able to port that into a Firebase a database, and we've been pulling it from there. So kind of had a question based on the information that you're asking people to fill in. How are you handling security of all this, making sure that people's social security numbers aren't stolen? Um, okay, so when we store like the information in our database, we're uh, encrypting it with, we're, we're gonna have like a public-private key pair, and we use our private key to encrypt everything into our database. Or, so the application has the public key that will encrypt everything, and then we have our private key when we need to send it out to the property manager. Is this just an iOS app or is it on Android as well? Right, so we developed this application in React Native, which is a cross-platform language that will, you know, we only have to write code once and it'll be able to be used on iPhone and uh, Android. I'm not sure about Windows, but no one really uses that. So. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much again. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Hi everyone, so our product is Unity, and we envision a new university ID. So let me go ahead and introduce you to the team. My name is Jordan, we have Alan, Nathan, Arthur, and James. And we had the opportunity to work with Workday on this project. So a huge shout out to our mentors, Raj, Scott, Ben, Nicole, and Danny. Thank you guys for helping us throughout these past two quarters. Also taking the time to drive all the way from Pleasanton, California to us present today. So we like to say that the student ID is the most important card that you will have at the university. Now, I, I know that's saying a lot, but we did our research. So I actually went to ucsbaccesscard.com and found a quote that said the access card is the most important card at the university. <laughs> <laughs> but, but why is it the most important card? This card is your key to all campus resources. It's your meal card, your ticket to events, as well as your gym pass. Without this card, you have no access to any of these facilities or services. And that's what makes it such a vital part in the day-to-day -day life of a university student. But there's some issues with a physical student ID that we need to address. The physical access card is simply outdated, and there's a lot of problems with this. The first one is retainability. If in the picture you lose your ID card, you lose your access to all the university resources that Jordan just talked about. Next, it deteriorates. Here's a picture of my access card. As you can see, the picture is really rubbed off and the barcode no longer scans. And lastly, it's fragmented. If I wanted to get information on university resources, such as the recreation center or the dining commons, I need to physically navigate to two different websites in order to get this information. So our proposed fix is Unity, which is a mobile web application that is both the physical access card and also access to university resources. And this solves our problems. The first one being now it's easily accessible. Because you pull it up on your phone, you can always have your ID ready. Next, 
it doesn't deteriorate. Because it is on the web, the picture won't rub off and the QR code will always scan. Lastly, it's now centralized. Uh, as you can see in the picture, not only is it your access card, but you can also access university information such as events and the recreation center. Right, so as Arthur has said, the university access card causes students many inconveniences. However, it also provides administrators a lot of problems as well. For one, the university ID card is expensive. In a university study done, in a study done throughout 50 universities, it said that an access card, uh, replacement cards will cost over $80 million at an average cost of $50 per each access card with 3.8 million students losing access cards per year. Furthermore, they are unsafe. As you can see above, this is the access card that we showed earlier, however with the name blurred out. If, if I were to present the student posing as Arthur, there would be no way for administrators to verify that I am not Arthur. Our app solves these problems. For one, it's economical. Generating new QR codes is free of charge, which would limit cost. Furthermore, it is safe. Furthermore, it is safe. As you can see on the left, that is our Unity scanner for admins to use. Upon check-in, student information in a picture of the student will be displayed, which will allow admin to verify that the student being admitted to the event is indeed the student who they claimed it to be. So before we talk about our application Unity, uh, we would like to explain our main component of our application, which is the Workday Student Cloud Platform. The Workday Student Cloud Platform aims to replace outdated, disjoint school systems uh, by, unifying, <coughs> by unifying these systems into one customizable application. These applications, this application manages things such as student finances, uh, student records, and also academic advising and much more. Our application interacts with um, this, the student workday platform via REST, uh, REST API calls. So now we're going to talk about the architecture of our application. So Unity is comprised of two main applications, one of which is a mobile web app that allows students to log in securely via OAuth 2.0 with their workday credentials to access their QR code. And then our second application is an Android QR code scanner that allows admins to check in students and also verify them against the student record store on Workday. These two applications make up Unity. And Unity as a whole expands on top of the Workday cloud system to provide a robust solution for student identification. Also, we have uh, our app stores other data, such as events, check-ins, and facilities on Firebase. And then now we're going to go into our demo. So we're first going to begin our demo by showing you how to create an event from an administrator perspective. So with admin permissions, we have a create event button and after uh, clicking on the button, we have this page where you can fill in all the fields for the event. And I include event host, event name, event type, date, location, and so on. And for the event that we're going to create, it's going to be summit.cs. So after clicking on create event, it is then added to our database and shows up in our list of events at the very top. <coughs> So now we're going to show you how to check in students to events, also from the, through our Android scanner application. So Nathan right here is going to log in as BKing with administrative permissions into this application. And he is then presented again with a list of events. And as you can see at the very top, we have summit.cs. So after clicking on that item, we're going to be presented with a camera. And this camera is now ready to scan QR codes. So we're going to have our student, Arthur, have his uh, Unity application open with his QR code and be scanned into the event. So after being scanned into the event, we can then see, <laughs> we can then verify that this is Arthur and this throughout, through his clear picture. Next, we're going to have Alan, who has borrowed his friend's QR code and photoshopped his face onto this picture, onto his phone picture. So he's going to go ahead and be scanned into the event. And as you can see, this hits our <laughs> Workday database 
And we can see that Alan is obviously not Aaron Day. So next, we're going to give you our preview of our student-facing application in more detail. OK, so yeah, I wanted to go over the web app a little bit more. This is the main page, and you can see it replaces the access card, so it has your photo and the QR code. Um, on the bottom right, you notice you can generate a new QR code if you ever feel like your QR code is being compromised. If you tab over to the right, you can get a little bit more on student information. Up top left is our navigation bar, which is uh, really the essence of our program because it allows you to get access to a lot of university resources. So I'm going to go into events. As you can see, we have a list of events. If I click in, let's say Delirium, you can see that a ticket is $4, there's 300 tickets available, and other information. Next, we have the Recreation Center. In the Rec Center, you have a number of recent check-ins in the past hour so you can know whether the Rec Center is crowded or not, as well as a phone number website, you have a map that you can zoom into, as well as hours and closures. And lastly, we have Dining Commons, which is my favorite. You can see how many remaining swipes you have for the week, another map if you ever forget where the Dining Commons are, and as well as hours and closures. And I'm going to go over to Ortega now because that's my favorite. Go to Ortega and you can tab over to the right and actually see the current uh, menu for today. So you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's our app. So uh, Unity is built to be easily adaptable to incorporate existing UCSB institutions. For example, the bus stickers, which right now are physical stickers that go on the physical access card, and because of that, they can be easily rubbed off and lost. With Unity, those would become profile flags, and because it's electronic, they would never be lost, and you can never misplace them. Uh, furthermore, if we decided to integrate Unity into a native platform, this would allow us some more convenient features, um, like integrating the QR code into a passbook application, for example, Apple Wallet, which is a fingerprint locked um, collection of authorized passes and payment options. Um, another great thing about Unity is, like we mentioned before, it's powered by the Workday Student Cloud Platform. And this means that it comes packaged with um, a number of complex services, like um, a newer billing system and OAuth secured login. What it also means is that any school that uses the Workday Student Cloud Platform would be a prime candidate for use with Unity, like any of these schools and many others. So throughout our development cycle, there are many issues that we face. And some of the biggest ones was collaborating as a team and working around each other's busy schedule. We use these technologies to help combat that. We use GitHub for a code repository, Jira for issue tracking, and Slack for communication. But ultimately, we found that scrumming face-to-face -face and using agile practices was the most effective way to get our work done. Another huge issue that we faced was the amount of new technologies that we had to use. None of us had any experience interacting with Firebase or coding in Kotlin or working with any of Workday's APIs. And Capstone gave us this opportunity to explore and implement these new technologies, uh, an experience that we wouldn't have got in a traditional classroom setting. And I believe that all of us up here today can say this has been the biggest project that we've ever tackled. And we're really proud to have presented to you today. So we believe that our application, Unity, securely replaces an old infrastructure and brings with it convenience and expandability. We believe that Unity is a future university ID. Thank you. with like existing um, uh, services, as well as like how easy would it be to support like importing data from like, existing admin services, right? Because like we just redid gold. And um, you know, one issue with this is it like, if it replaces completely, um, you know, all of this infrastructure, it's gonna take like a big cost to like merge everything. Right, so that's a good. Right, so that's a good concern. And the essence of our application is that it's built on the Workday Student platform. So what would actually happen is the school would have to purchase Workday Student, but with it, all student information is stored on it. So what really the university gets is it 
gets the student platform, but it also gets Unity on top of it. So our application specifically would have seamless integration if that were to happen. So uh, my phone, I forgot to charge my phone last night. So if it died today because we're going to be here all morning, would that mean I'm locked out of my dorm and can't get into the dining commons to eat lunch? Um, so uh, one of the reasons that we chose QR codes is because they're very versatile. Uh, for example, you could just print out the QR code and keep it in your wallet like you do with access cards, or you could have it on your phone as part of Passbook, something like that. You could really do anything you want with it. So that would solve people without smartphones and people with dead phones. Or you could log into your friend's phone and get it that way, because it's everywhere. Do I have to use it? The mic? Yeah. Oh, you don't? Um, but uh, we already got the problem. Some it. people ask questions, others said they couldn't hear it. So we should use you it. don't have to, but there's a risk that people don't hear you in the back. Okay. I think we can just use it. I'm charging this one. Hello, everybody. We're Stage Presence. Uh, our mentors are Log Me In. Let me start with a question. How many people in this room have ever taken a formal class in the art of giving presentations? Raise your hands. So maybe 10%. Now raise your hands if you have ever had to give a presentation that was important to either your personal life or your career. So there's a pretty big disparity there. That's why we developed our platform. Stage Presence is a platform that allows you to train in the art of giving presentations and to practice a presentation of your choosing until it's perfect. We have three different curriculum that you can choose from. Whether you want to be an entrepreneur or whether you want to be an actor, you're going to have to do different things to prepare. We use state-of-the-art machine learning techniques to capture analytics about the audio, video, and textual data of your presentation. And then, we use badges and challenges to make the process fun. Let's go ahead and log in. So I'm on the entrepreneur path, as you can see. I'm here giving a demo. This is your hub. This is where you see your curriculum. Each section is themed along something you might do in your chosen career. As an entrepreneur, we often have to give demos. So that's what this first section is about. Now, one thing you have to do when you're giving a demo is speak precisely and quickly so that you can meet your time limit. We're going to do a challenge, an articulation challenge that will help us show what that kind of thing is. This is a tongue twister challenge. Simple, right? The goal is to speak clearly and to do it quickly within a time limit. We're going to have our TA, Steve, help us with this challenge. So let's go ahead and... Steve might need to see the script. Okay, so currently uh, we are going to record a video on our computer and then pass the file path 
However, there is functionality to upload it to our server. Since we're running it all in one computer, we don't need to do that today. Now, Steve, uh, you should try to speak clearly. Try to do it within a reasonable amount of time. And if you want, you can move back and forth. You can modulate your pitch, and you can do uh, facial expressions as well. She sells seashells by the seashore. <laughs> so it's going to go three, two, one, and then you go. Uh, She sells seashells by the seashore. The shells she sells are surely seashells, so if she sh sells shells on the seashore, I'm sure she sells seashore shells. Thank you, Steve. All right, now we're going to go through a little bit of extra processing to get this video where it needs to be. And watch Little King of the Hill while we're at it. Okay, while that's processing, we're going to tell you a little bit about how our technology works. So first, after you give us the video of your presentation, we decouple it into its audio and visual elements, so we're able to process those parts independently. Um, as far as the audio goes, we extract a transcript of what you said, and afterwards, we see how quickly you spoke during your presentation, because if you speak too quickly, people might not be able to keep up, and it might not be able to understand what you're saying. So, and if you speak too slowly, no one's going to want to listen to you speak at all. And we also keep track of the pitch of your voice over the course of your speech. If you speak with a little too much variation in the pitch of your voice, it's going to sound completely unnatural. And if you speak monotonously, you're going to put everyone in the room to sleep because you sound like a robot. After that, we clean up the data a little bit and we, in order to give you the best feedback possible. So one of the most important components of an effective speech is to speak clearly to maximize your audience comprehension. And it's even better if you can deliver your lines without forgetting, um, um, oh, without forgetting your script. And to that end, we came up with a metric that we're calling articulation. Articulation is built around comparing our speech-to-text transcript of what you said with the target script that we provided to you. To do that, we calculate the word error rate. This is defined as the number of word additions, deletions, or substitutions necessary to take what you were supposed to say and turn that into what you actually said. If that sounds a little high level, you can glance at our slides for an example. Additionally, we use machine learning analytics to extract the emotional content of your speech. This is important because as we all know, a dry presentation doesn't impress anybody. Next, we process the video data. First, we identify the user's face and track their emotions second by second. We want to make sure that what you're expressing with your face matches the sentiment of your script. But emotion is not the only thing that we care about. We also want to make sure that you use your space efficiently. That's why we follow you and track your steps to let you know when you've been standing in one place for too long. Presentations are usually more engaging when you're moving around, so we want to make sure that you give the best presentation you can. Finally, it's back to the server, where we clean up the data a little bit, remove any outliers so that we're not showing you a crazy graph. Uh, we do some statistics to get the essential things that we're trying to show you uh, you did well or poorly, and to build our actionable feedback that you'll be able to read plain English that you can act upon. Then we make our graphs and send it all up to you at the user interface. So it's done processing now. We can see Steve's video here, and he did pretty well. He got four stars. Uh, 
overall star rating, and then within each category, you have a numerical rating, and then within each of those, you can see details of how you performed. So Steve's presentation was not very clear, and he would do well to pronounce each word carefully. Let's take a look at what we heard versus what we, the script said. Uh, sure sell, this kind of thing. So you'll be able to see what you said and thus improve upon uh, your delivery of your script. We tracked Steve's facial sentiment. Well, there's some smiling in there, so let's see if we captured it. We did. Steve's primary and only emotion was joy. <laughs> That's good. Uh, we tracked his motion throughout the presentation, and uh, when you've been standing in one place too long, we give you a little red highlight to let you know. Uh, and you can go ahead and scroll through to see how you're occupying your space. And we do the same thing with the speech rate and the pitch. You can get uh, plain English feedback. You did great work on your speech rate, Steve. As you can see, it's very steady throughout. And you can see your pitch as well, and you can check out how they correlate with what you're saying. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to hear this. Can we? OK, it's probably not worth it, but if you could here, Steve, he'd probably be talking a little higher up here and a little lower down here, a little higher up here, and so on and so forth. Now we're going to show you the last uh, feature that's really important. You've been training and learning these fundamental skills, but you're preparing for a big presentation at work or at a wedding, and you want to practice that. That's why we have a custom training. You can pick a script that you've written and iterate upon it using our script writing tools, which Ryan will talk about. So within custom mode, we have tools specifically designed to help you build the best possible script. We offer synonym suggestions for words used too frequently and for words that might be too obscure for your audience. Additionally, we analyze the readability of your script, which gives you an idea of what level of education is required in order for your audience to fully understand your presentation. So for example, in this one, we've picked up words such as democratize, which you can then switch for words such as balance, adjust, equalize. And later on, you can also see how technology is highlighted multiple times because you've used it multiple times. And we offer uh, synonyms for that as well to give you an idea of maybe making your script a little more diverse and improving it. Now, we already uh, recorded. Uh, I recorded myself doing this presentation. And we pre-processed it so that we wouldn't have to wait while processes. So let's go ahead and take a look at the feedback that we got on it. Now, as you can see, we have the similar metrics. We can see how I moved throughout a much longer presentation, which is important because we can see if I stand in one place and when I move and how long I'm standing in that place for. We can also look at it this way if we choose to. We've got the other metrics that we would have had, uh, as well as the formal feedback. Here it says that my tone of voice varied a bit too much. And you can see I have a little bit too much of my uh, graph is outside of this green good zone. So I might want to work on that for the future. And in this way, you'll be able to iterate upon a presentation uh, that you have to give, not just train your skills using our curriculum. And that's our product. Any? Um, no, you use the mic, it's really bad, otherwise they don't hear you in the back. Um, in the future, would you add a y-axis to the graph? So we thought about what the user needs to see. And because everyone has a different fundamental pitch that they're speaking at, because everyone has a different rate that they're comfortable speaking at, uh, there's not really one absolute speech rate or one absolute pitch that is correct. For that reason, we chose to just show things relative to where you're speaking and show you a good range and a bad range. That way you'll know, you know, I need to keep it a bit more even. And you can go ahead and go to that point and actually listen and hear it. So it's not necessary. However, you can get that uh, data if you want to right there. Thank you. Uh, quick second question over there. Can you speak to your technology choices and in, uh, in what, what's doing all this? 
I'm sorry, our technology choices end. Yeah, what, what are you using for, uh, for measuring all these? Uh, so our, I guess we can go one by one. Uh, no, it's, it's going to be quicker. So we use uh, Librosa to calculate uh, speech spectral data, so the audio data like your pitch. We use Watson to uh, calculate the transcript, and then we will feed that back into Watson to get the sentiment. We use the Google Video API to get uh, your facial coordinates and the emotion at each frame. And then we use uh, oh, and OpenCV as well uh, for backup video processing. And then we use a fair amount of Python libraries to do some statistics and uh, data cleaning. Cool. Is there a question here? Um, do you guys think you could integrate like your video recording portion of it into the website itself? So then like you click a button on the website and you record the video right there and then it just directly uploads immediately? I think that's a great feature. Uh, and the reason we don't have it today is because then we'd be sending things back and forth between our own computer, you know, along different ports. So it would just be a waste of time. However, for a final product, that's definitely something we would implement. All right, thank you. Thank, thanks again. All right, next up um, is perception with aerospace. Hi guys, we're Team Perception. Uh, my name is Abhishek, this is Donish, this is Ben, Sai, and Jake. And so, in an age where big data is growing and gaining popularity within industry, many companies today have massive data lakes with more data than they know what to do with. Um, and on top of this, data became, or begins accumulating quicker than humans can process, and it just begins to stack up. So, the solution to this is large-scale automation using AI and machine learning models to quickly process this data efficiently and, uh, sorry, uh, just process that data efficiently. Um, so our partner company, Aerospace, came to us with over 100 terabytes of video data and no viable means of processing this data. They wanted to be able to track specified objects within a video. Um, so what we did was create an API that takes in a target image with a specified object and a video in which someone would like to track that object in. And we return that same video with a bounding box around the target image or target object and a label for that object. Uh, our product features two main components, um, an object tracking API as well as a web app. The object tracking API is wonderful for its uh, plug and play properties that are crucial for uh, a large base of use cases as well as platforms. Um, and on top of this, we built the web app so that we can have a very easy to use user interface for our customers. Uh, this way, within a, the clicks of a few buttons, um, they'll have a process video in hand. Uh, say, for example, we have a, an aviation enthusiast who wants to track airplanes inside a video. Um, all he has to do is upload an image of the airplane he wishes to track, the video itself, click process, and then within a few minutes he has a process video. Uh, some of the use cases we can apply this to um, are uh, military applications, say um, satellite imagery and telemetry. Um, along with this, we have surveillance. It can be military, police surveillance in general. Uh, as well as consumer sports, say if a sports announcer wants to track a soccer ball during a match. So now that we've given you an idea of what our main goals were and what we hope to accomplish with our product, we're going to show you what we were able to finish and what we currently have over the past two quarters. So when you first go to our website, this is the page that you land at. Um, it's just our landing page and scrolling down gives you the information about what we're telling you right now along with who you are and a way to get in touch with us. Um, going all the way back up, there's a, way, uh, there's a button for you to register for an account. 
Uh, and if you prefer to just do a single time job and get it done with quick, you can click the try it out and go through the entire flow. So I'm going to log in with an account that I made previously for this demo. So when you log in, you're uh, sent to your dashboard. And the main aspect of the dashboard is to provide you with a box for you to upload your image and your video. So I'm going to upload a job that I have on the side. It's just an image of a plane and an air show. So as soon as I click process, uh, both of those things are uploaded to our server. And on the right-hand side, there's your job queue that always shows the three most current jobs that you spawned. And as you can see on the top, we've added the new job that we just created. Uh, the next thing of importance to look at would be the My File section. Um, that has two separate columns, one for all your images and one for the, all the videos that you've uploaded. Um, inside this section, you can just see what you previously uploaded and select, uh, let's say, this image and uh, a game to send off as a new job and click Process. So without having to re-upload the same data again, you can spawn off another job. Um, so we have some, uh, while, while our uh, new job finishes processing, we have some example videos from before. Um, for example, uh, Ben was driving his car down the freeway. I was sitting next to him, and I recorded this video. Uh, it just shows some cars passing by, and the system's able to pick up the cars that are in the rear view window as well and track them easily. So the main purpose of showing you this video is just to show that any person that has a phone, webcam, any recording at all can easily plug in their data and get, get it, uh, the tracking that they desire. A second video that would be cool to look at is uh, a military application video. So this shows a Hummer driving around, and we've, we've just tracked the Hummer throughout the video to see how it's going and the different tracks that it takes. And this is some of the applications that we could have in the military aspect if we're able to see um, the war zone areas or distress, er distress areas. So uh, now that we've finished processing the video that we originally put off of the air show, let's just show you guys what it looks like. Uh, so the image that was sent in was of the plane, so it's tracking all the planes throughout the video, uh, whether they're together, grouped up, or going far apart from each other. There's variations in speed. They go over each other, but the system's still able to maintain its integrity and track it. As you can see over here, uh, as the plane slowly fades in, as soon as the system recognizes it's a plane, it starts tracking it throughout. So with this being such a big product, there were many things that we could have focused on, and we chose to put the main three features that we have as these. Uh, a, we wanted to have a seamless user interface so we could have a high customer retention. We believe that if your system is easy to use, neat and clean, people want to keep coming back whenever they have a use case for it. The second thing we wanted to focus on was having high accuracy in the object detection so that you know, if you want to track a plane, it's not accidentally identifying a bike or a car as a plane, and it's only identifying the plane. We accomplished this just by uh, testing and making the filter very tight-knit for what it would identify correctly. Uh, the last thing we wanted to focus on was having high scalability. We wanted to ensure that as more customers come and more clients want to upload their data, our website doesn't slow down to a crawl or become a hindrance to use. So we were able to accomplish this by making uh, the job tracking asynchronous. What that means is that when you want to track an object, that's sent off to a separate job queue in the back in a server. So the main server that's for the website is able to just focus on customers and making sure that your experience is clean. To implement our seamless user interface, we have two main user flows. The guest user flow is for first-time users who just want to try our product without any registration process. Our second user flow is for recurring users who can create an account and gain access to the dashboard that provides extra features to enhance usability. Our dashboard is the hub for managing user activity and media. We save the files that the user uploads so they, can, so they do not have to re-upload the same files again. With this, the user can mix and match images and videos to create different outputs. We also save the process videos so the user can, um, so the user can rewatch and download whenever they want. So behind the scenes, we have something called a convolutional neural network, which allows us to track all the objects in the video. This project was based on a research project from the University of Washington. While the original YOLO, this is what it's called, which is you only look, you only look once, uh, will find every object that it was trained on in the video. But with our modifications, we can take the user's image that they put input to us and use that to narrow down the search space and find the object that they were particularly looking for. Finally, so. We have some future goals that we would like to work on in the uh, that will hopefully improve our uh, website even better. Um, one of the first things that we want to implement is something called a Siamese neural network. Uh, currently, we're able to 
it, the user able to uh, upload an image and we can find a general object in the video. But with this network, we can, let's say, for example, uh, the user input a red car and he gave us a video with several different types of car. We can track that specific red car throughout the video. Another thing that we want to add is to improve user um, experience. And for that, we want to add statistics. So for example, if a user put in several videos, they can see the frequency of an object being tracked, uh, maybe a hot spot, so where the object is most common, uh, or maybe the object that is uh, most, popu most popular in the user's database. Um, finally, we also want to add live tracking. So instead of just having to upload a video and then wait for it to be tracked, uh, you could do it in real time. Um, so thank you for listening to us. We're Team Perception, and if you have any questions, let's ask. Questions for, for the team? How do you implement your like a video this kind of tracking algorithms? Do you use existing software or you develop your own? So we do uh, existing. We use uh, existing software. So behind the scenes, we have something called uh, OpenCV to do the original like video processing, and then we use the Yolo network, which is written C, to do fast processing. And what, on top of that, we do some of our own modifications to be able to take in an image, find what the object is in the in image, and use that to find the objects in the video and track only that specific object. All right. Any other questions? Um, do you have any qualms with helping usher in a cyberpunk dystopia of uh, complete surveillance? <laughs> um, I don't think we're trying to get into the politics of that, but <laughs> that's up to the user in this case. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, next team is preparing a Game of Thrones uh, together with Northrop Grumman. This thing on? All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is Trent Krzyzewski, and let me introduce my teammates. Sam Goyle, Peter Ginty, Chet Goziel, and Mario Infante. We partnered with Northrop Grumman for this project to build a aerial mapping system. So let me introduce, introduce to you Game of Drones. So the main motivation behind our project was that we wanted to easily map an unknown area in a cost-efficient manner. There are solutions out there that can do this, but they are either expensive or lack the necessary precision we are looking for. But why do we care? What can we do with an unknown area? Well, two months ago, this article came out by GPS World that detailed how they used LIDAR to map the mine rooms in the Guatemala jungle. LIDAR stands for Light Detection Ranging, and works by shooting a laser and returning the nearest point or the distance to the nearest point. Because the LIDAR was able to pierce the jungle canopy, they, were to, they could see that the mine ruins were much more expansive than they had previously known. They could map the jungle floor and see that there were roads and buildings that were not viewable from the sky. <clears throat> but this is a global application, and we were thinking more locally for our project. By using our system, one can map the cliffs in Isla Vista. Just this last year, a house had their back deck collapsed due to cliff erosion. If they had had accurate maps of where the cliffs were eroding and how fast they were eroding, they could have taken preventative measures. Another example would be the before and after effects of a mudslide in Montecito. 
A lot of land was moved around, so if they had accurate maps of land before the slide and after the slide, they could have seen which area lost the most land and where they would want to focus their cleanup efforts. So now I'll go into some detail about the other solutions that are out there and what makes ours better. The first solution is photogrammetry. So photogrammetry uses a series of photos and epipolar geometry to measure the distance between objects within that photo. This method needs aerial photos and lacks the necessary precision we are looking for. For example, it is very good at telling the distance between objects within the photo, but not the height of an object within a photo, such as a hill. Other solutions out there are expensive LiDAR systems. This, this sensor right here, which is the most similar to the one we use, costs $4,000 and is a standalone piece of hardware. It does not need any additional input information or extra equipment to output a 3D map. However, it is very expensive and therefore not a cost-efficient solution. Our solution uses a $350 LiDAR sensor that has limited capabilities. So by integrating this sensor with a drone and a Raspberry Pi, which is essentially just a mini computer, we were able to build a mapping system. For this system, we had to identify all the compatible hardware, interface them together, and do SWAPC analysis on our system. SWAPC stands for the size, weight, power, and cost of the system. Our solution was a cost-efficient mapping system with an easy-to-use app and autonomous capabilities. So now I will hand it over to Peter, who will talk about the architecture of our system. So now I'm going to walk you guys through the uh, various steps that need to occur in our system in order to generate a 3D map. So first, we open up our Android app, and we click the Start button. This sends a command to the Raspberry Pi on board our drone to start the system. Uh, this prompts the, la the Raspberry Pi to send out two commands. Uh, the first of these is to begin collecting telemetry data from the drone. So uh, basically, the Raspberry Pi will constantly pull uh, data such as the current drone position and rotation angles. The Raspberry Pi will also uh, start collecting points from the LiDAR sensor. Uh, the next step is these two sets of data points are combined into coordinates and trans the, these coordinates are transformed using the rotation angles of our drone. This batch of coordinates is then sent over to the Android device and finally the viewer is refreshed so you can see up there that the points are rendered on the phone. And uh, these last three steps here basically are going to repeat over and over uh, as the drone is flying so that points can continually be sent to the Android device. Um, oh. So I know everyone wants to see a live demo, but I'm sorry we can't do that today. There's a few problems with flying inside. Um, the first being uh, the propellers actually generate a lot of wind and turbulence, so the flight's a lot sh shakier than we usually have it. And also, LiDAR isn't good at picking up um, points that against dark absorbent materials, such as the carpet. So we won't be able to do a live demo, but we do have a video um, with a couple different angles. So this is the drone taking off. And we got this footage by actually... Uh, putting a GoPro on the drone. We usually don't have the GoPro, we just did it for the uh, purposes of the video. Um, and the GoPro is basically showing the same angle that the LiDAR would be looking at. Um, so this is basically how we did our demos. We would fly a box around the mounds. Um, yeah, and then we would get this resulting map on the Android device. So this is what it looks like on the actual device. Um, you can pan around, zoom in, zoom out, uh, and really see everything that you want from it, as well as, um, yeah, and you can also like load different models that you've done in the past. Uh, these videos, um, we probably flew for about two to five minutes on all of our demos. That's a good enough time to get enough points to show it. Um, and here's just another picture uh, of what we were mapping and then the map that we created. And now Mario will talk a little bit about how this is done. See this? Where's the click button? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail as to how we were able to produce our 3D point cloud. So we basically 
split our uh, data into three coordinate systems. We have the LiDAR coordinate system, which is uh, information relative to the LiDAR sensor. We have the drone coordinate system, which is information relative to the drone itself. And we have the world coordinate system, which is information relative to the or drone's original launch position. So the first one is the LiDAR coordinate system. So this is basically our rotating sensor that is rotating and scanning whatever object we're over. And what's returned is a two-dimensional point cloud of our object. So if we were over a flat surface, this is roughly what our point cloud would return to us. And if we hover over something such as a box, this is roughly what we would see. But note that we can't see the sides of the box. So what we would do is we would hover over to the left side of the box, and we would hover over to the right side of the box. And we would combine this information to get a two-dimensional outline of our object. So now I'll move on to our drone coordinate system. Our drone coordinate system is in three dimensions, since we have the roll, pitch, and yaw of the drone. So for example, if I were flying towards you guys with the drone, oh, can you help me out with this? So we have roll, we have pitch, up and down, and then we have yaw. And those are the rotations about the three axes. And so recall my example from the box. It's possible that when we got the side of the box that the drone was actually tilted when we were collecting these points. So in reality, this is what the LiDAR saw, because the LiDAR assumes that we're stationary and we're pointing downward. So we take this into account that every time, by, um, every time we gather a point, we take the current roll, pitch, or yaw angle and apply it to the point. And um, this is actually based off of the uh, rotation about axes from linear algebra, where the roll, pitch, and yaw are our angles of rotation. So now that we have our point cloud and we've adjusted for tilt, we can bring it into the world's coordinate system with respect to the drone's original launch position. And as we're gathering data, we, no, we not only have to account for the tilt of the drone, but also where it has moved to. So as we're moving over our box, we have to take into account um, move each point to where the drone is moving to. So when we're flying over the box, this is roughly what our point cloud would render. And what we're left with is a beautiful 3D point cloud of our box. Right, so for future work, what we'd want to do is, um, the drone has autonomous capabilities. <clears throat> so we'd want to incorporate that with our app so we could select pinpoints on like Google Maps per se and have the drone autonomously fly over and collect data and build maps itself. And another feature we'd want to add to the app would be stitching maps together being able to create larger areas, say we want to map all of campus or all of Isla Vista or a city, we could create multiple maps and system together for a larger scan. And lastly, a feature that would be interesting to add would be being able to see how certain models change over time. So like if we want to measure the cliffs by the beach, we could see how they change over time and how they erode. But overall, we were very excited with our results and we hope you guys are too. Thanks for listening and any questions? Thank you. Questions in the back? Um, do you guys perform any sort of like GPS tracking with the drone? Because say like you send the drone out a few miles, you, it might be useful to know where you're taking the image from. So the drone does have GPS tracking capabilities, but the, it returns GPS coordinates and that wasn't necessarily accurate enough for us to measure. Like let's say we're five meters to the left or five meters to the right the GPS coordinate will still be the same. So we use velocity returned from the drone and then plot through the course where the drone is flying. Cool. The GPS is available off the drone. Cool. Thank you. Any other question? All right, thank you very much. All right, next up is uh, vegetables and rice, uh, together with In Touch.
check, check. The, the audio for the laptop, just make sure it's on. Okay. Check the audio first. Audio, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, I, think, I think audio is on. Audio is on? I think audio should be. Okay, here's one. No, it's just, uh, it's probably on, just making sure that you don't have it turned on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Hello everyone, uh, we are Team Vegetable and Rice. We are working on a, a project, a, a, tele, a virtual reality solution to telemedicine, and our mentors are from InTouch Health. And here, first let me introduce our uh, team. I'm Yuan Qi, the team lead, and Kenneth, the UX designer, and Jin Fa and Shou Zhi, they are Unity engineers. Uh, so let me first describe our problem. So what's the problem we've been working on for the uh, past few months? So at the beginning of last quarter, our mentors told us that most physicians in telemedicine they face two problems, and especially the first one is the limited uh, screen space, so they cannot put everything they want in their small screen. Luckily enough, if you have multiple screen, but if you don't, you have to just switch between applications, which is uh, frustrating. And also another one is there are too much data to deal with. So a lot of data come from different medical companies and in all in different formats, like uh, lab reports, medical records, and some scan images. And all requires different inter interaction and it's hard to learn and interact if you just use mouse and keyboard. Yeah, so, so it's all about productivity. So that's our um, main purpose. We want to boost a physician's productivity in um, telemedicine. And here comes our solution, a virtual reality telemedicine uh, platform. So basically, we want to explore, um, explore the potential of VR and uh, create a uh, productive and accessible uh, platform. So here is a scenario video uh, in which Dr. Chen performs a uh, stroke consult over the, uh, our application, and let's see how he did it. I got it. Can you send me his most up-to-date brain scans? In the meantime, I will look at the patient's historical records and CT scans. Just a minute. I'm looking at the historical records right now. From what it looks like, the patient's vital signs and condition seem normal. I'm going to take a look at the patient's previous CT scans. To where the previous brain scans are located in my Windows File Explorer. I'll select the oldest brain scan and scroll through to the more recent scans. Hmm, it looks like the patient has a history of dealing with brain tumors. The new brain scans should be coming soon. Thanks, I just got the new CT brain scans. I'm going to look at them right now. Can you double check on the patient and make sure he is okay? Will do, doctor. I'm going to put our live video in my eye space so I can keep track of you while I examine the brain scan. 
I need to take a closer look at this paint. Alright, I don't think our patient's current episode is related to this history of brain tumors. Nurse, I'm sending you the stroke response questions right now. Please ask the patient the questions and send me the results. Okay, I have received it. Okay, that's it. And uh, amazingly, uh, our uh, Dr. Chen potentially saved a life. And uh, hopefully he saved him. Uh, so we, we see here our, pro, our application truly shows the power of virtual reality in telemedicine and it really uh, boosts the productivity here. And uh, we're all driven by these three design principles in the development process. And they are space, interaction, and extensibility. Uh, so the first two design principles are, um, address the problem we mentioned earlier, the limited space and uh, too much data. Well, the third one is uh, proposed as programmers when we develop our application we found uh, we cannot just implement everything and we propose this our uh, third principle and then let's um, let's our teammate to uh, introduce the space uh, let me pass it to Jinfa. so as we mentioned before one of the main problem doctor face is that their screen are too small and this leads to our first design principle space uh, we redefine the space in virtual reality uh, and make it more accessible to users. Uh, we have three zones designated for three tasks. They are walking space, eye space, and sight space. So walking space is the main area in front of you where you can inter interact with your apps. It's curved, so windows at the edge of your field of view can be accessed uh, easily and it, they are just as visible as something in front of you. And you may also have noticed in the video, uh, the doctor put the video streaming and uh, white monitors in his eye space, which is fixed to the eyes. So you can always monitor them while looking around. It's an ideal space to put important data. And the last space we want to introduce is a side space which is in small area of your space, which is immediately to the left outside of your field of view. The side space is used for storing small widgets. For example, the, uh, the doctor has a calendar and message inbox in his space. Now let. Thank you. The second design principle we focus on is redefining interaction. We want to make our interface simple and intuitive so then the doctors can live with a uh, frustration-free. Incorporating hand gestures into VR allows a natural and immersive experience. We decided on three intuitive gestures that are recognized through machine learning and logistic regression. Here you can see three of them. Um, the first one is the push action, which sends away the, the windows into the background so you can focus on the graph in the foreground. The second action is the pull, where you can reopen the minimized windows. And the last one is the spread, which you can reposition the windows onto the canvas. So in combining hand gestures and controllers, users can fully interact with dashboard windows in the working space. They can grab, resize, and reposition the windows to their own liking, thereby increasing their productivity. Okay, we also redefine extensibility. During our developing process, we found two problems. The first one is uh, the, da the medical data are come from different companies, and those companies have already established uh, professional applications and websites. We just cannot re-implement the wheel. The second is the doctor intends to use what they're familiar with. We, our, pro our project designed to help them not create chaos. So here we come the extensibility. Now the doctors can use Unity native applications, the Windows applications, and the web applications to help them. 
Here is the Windows native applications. Now you can open up our image viewer in the Windows File Explorer and like select them. And also the web applications. This is just a simple web applications. You can touch on the web applications and open up our video streamings. So basically, this is our solution. And you, as you have seen from the video, you can already tell that our application can boost their productivity. We have provided them uh, so many uh, features. And as to the future work, uh, there are still something we can do in the future. Like we can implement more uh, Unity nat native apps because they, they have the best performance. And of course, um, also they can fully utilize VR features. Like you can render some 3D models in VR space and play with it. Uh, but with some traditional apps, you don't have the feature. But and also you can we can also working on improving the graphics quality. Uh, well. Uh, we've been focusing on implementing functionalities this two quarters, so we don't have much time in uh, polishing all those designs, and none of us is artists. But we can still do that in the future, because just make uh, physicians more pleasant and comfortable using our app, make it just like a AAA game, maybe. But not a game, but the application. So thanks. Uh, thank everybody for coming today. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> All right, question over there. Hi, so I'm actually interested in going into the health field, and I was wondering, I think one of the most important aspects of healthcare is face-to-face -face patient interaction, especially with the doctor, because it will make the patient feel more comfortable. Um, how do you think this technology would affect that? Uh, what kind of technology do like, um, since they're using a VR mm -hmm. and they're not actually interacting with their patient, they don't actually have to see the patient face to face when they're using the technology. And I think that's seeing them face to face is very important in healthcare. Um, how do you think that this technology would affect that? How would you still get that comfortability with the doctor? Well, the I can patient? answer this question. Um, for VR, the doctor needs to wear a headset, and sometimes that might be off putting to the patient. So we chose to not have that in our, in our scenario. Um, you know, maybe in other applications it might be more appropriate, but we felt that it's not appropriate for the scenario that we demonstrated. Yeah, also like uh, in our demo videos, we can see a video streaming like talking to a nurse, but in real case it's more like talking to the patient directly. So I think this feature can fill in the gap of like how to talk to the patient directly. Thank you. Thanks. Questions over there. How steep of a learning curve is it to use your product, especially for a doctor who might not be as adept to the button and joysticks that comes with the VR? Yeah, yeah. So we focus on that problem and we have thought about that. We want to uh, improve the productivity instead of uh, making them uh, learning some new things. But, uh, but always, uh, this, uh, something is always true that you, s you still have to learn something to, uh, to just um, fully uh, use our application. And uh, like the hand gestures, they are very intuitive, like pull, push, and swap to just re rearrange those windows. And we just, uh, and we don't have more uh, hand gestures because those three is very, uh, um, are very simple and intuitive to learn. But more gestures could only um, introduce more troubles. And uh, again, uh, the extensibility deals with the problem that tr physicians have some uh, familiar applications. So they can still use the same applications in the VR environment. So, that's, uh, so they can still have a very uh, uniform experience in VR within VR or without VR. So uh, this is more of a VR problem, but did you guys look into uh, in improve stability so like you can see the, all the information because like it was kind of like going up and down and I think that would be a little difficult to r like look at all the information on the screen. Uh, so because um, actually when you wear the headset you won't feel this cheeky or because uh, we are recording it from the our screen our desktop screen and uh, the different uh, um, field of view will um, cause some trouble and uh, if you just <laughs> wear a, a real headset, you, you feel quite comfortable from my experience. 
All right, sorry guys, I have to uh, cut this short. I'll give you one last quick question because you raised your hand, but then you have to go to the poster and check it out. Sure. Uh, my question was, uh, so I've worked as like an EMT in the ambulance before, and your scenario was like of a stroke situation. Um, to speak to the other question asker person, <laughs> that how do you, what limitations do you see in the VR space for you know, interacting with the patients directly. Currently, if I was trying to assess a patient, I would like to be able to, you know, physically interact with the patient as opposed to being in a virtual space. Uh, I saw that you put some of the vital signs in, in your VR kind of environment, but what other types of ways could we physically interact with a patient in a VR space? And second, I also wanted to know what type of machine learning techniques did you use uh, in your um, program? It's hard to say what can we uh, integrate uh, here, but as to the machine learning, it's just, uh, actually it's a simple logistic regression. We take a, about 100 samples from, from the track and compare that to the training data. And uh, in the tra for, in for training data, the, the size is about, uh, uh, about fi uh, 50, and uh, we just compare those. Uh, <coughs> yeah, to answer the patient questions, like uh, our design and our product aim at telemedicals. It's not like if you have the ac access to a doctor immediately, you definitely can go. But like our solutions is aiming at like cross country or like cross states. And I think the, vi the vitals and the, the video streaming is, is enough for the doctor to know the basic information and give the first feedback immediately. And, and like more further uh, treatments, you still need to go to the hospital. And this is just a suggestion and a telemedical solution, yeah. Awesome, uh, thanks for the questions. For those that we couldn't uh, have here, please you know, check out the posters and the team afterwards. And thanks, to t uh, thanks again for the presentation. <laughs> All right, next up is uh, Dollar Flow with uh, their sponsor, Elementum. Back in again, the usual oh, stuff, right? Oh, I see. Um, yep, there it is. Top. All right, hi everybody. Uh, we're Team Cashflow, and we had the opportunity to work with Elementum, which is a supply chain management company located in Mountain View, California. Uh, so our app, Purchase Match, is basically going to be one of the tools at their disposal as they work on becoming the platform of choice in supply chain management, which is a $25 trillion industry. So we're going to start with an introduction of our team. Uh, I'm Milan Butra. Uh, that's Yoon Lee, Alex Kang. Uh, Dennis Fong, and then Alexander Yuan. All right, so for a little bit of background on what our problem is, uh, basically the Elementum executives uh, found an issue with the process of buying and selling goods. And so there's three main documents involved in this process. There's purchase orders, sales orders, and then shipping invoices. And these have to be matched to one another in order to move forward in the pipeline. All right, to go to go into details and uh, purchase order, 
Uh, companies right now um, follow this process to uh, purchase or sell their products. So in this uh, process right now, the potential delay is sending these documents or entering um, these documents into an enterprise resource planning. So initially, a buyer would uh, create the purchase order um, from his enterprise resource planning, which is later then sent to the seller. So purchase order is basically a formal document saying what I want to buy, uh, how much is this going to cost, and how many items I want to buy. OK, so and now on the seller's side, uh, he's uh, overwhelmed with multiple purchase orders from multiple buyers. So let's just look at one instance of a single purchase order he has to process. Um, so he, after he fully agrees upon the purchase order, which says the items, price, and the quantity, he'll then enter that into his enterprise resource planning, which uh, requires manual input, which is the room for delay and uh, human error. So after that process, um, he would send that back to the buyer through email or mail, which uh, um, then the buyer will have to put that into his enterprise resource planning, which is another source of uh, potential delay and human error. But once all that process has been acknowledged, uh, the seller will go ahead and ship the purchase goods along with the shipping invoice. And then once that's been acknowledged again, uh, the buyer will proceed to give payment to the seller. And that's the end of the process right now. So the problem with the current purchase order pipeline is that there's a lot, there's too much manual input in the matching process. So whenever a buyer or a seller wants to create a purchase order or a sales order, they first have to notify the other party through email, which causes it up to a 24 hour delay. And after these confirmation emails, the, both the buyer and seller have to manually input the details of the orders into their respective ERP systems. And this introduces the possibility for human error. And because of this, companies are wasting a lot of time and wasting a lot of money. And this is a problem that our app is trying to fix. Yeah, so that's where we come in. Um, our process is to automate this whole matching process. What we've created is a mobile application for both the buyer and the seller to use. And this will be an interface for both parties to cleanly enter in their sales order or purchase orders. And then our app handles all the business logic to match these documents. And so from this, we can eliminate the delay from manually sending these documents, matching on the other side. We can have one party send a document, the other one send their document, and the app can notify the respective party if this order has already been matched or not. So how do we actually go about matching documents inside our system? So first, users upload images of their, sh or their shipping order and purchase orders to our system. And once in our system, the, these documents are placed in a processing pipeline, which will be able to send these images to Google Cloud Vision. And in Google Cloud Vision, we do a image to text here, and Google Cloud Vision returns a text file to us, which we're able to parse and get relevant information from. To get this relevant information, from, relevant information we parse through this text file looking for keywords such as carrier, shipping ID, and invoice number. Once we have those, we place this data inside our database and qu make queries against it, seeing if any of the items we just placed in our database has been in our data so da database before. And with that, if we do find a match, we notify our users of this match. Yeah, so now we can show you like a walkthrough of our demo. Um, so let's play that video of how our app looks. Um, in this special case right here, we're going to go through and show how a buyer and seller interact with this app. Our first step is we're going to have a buyer log into the app. Um, so we're presented with the login screen here. Um, so first thing you do is enter your username, uh, your password. This is all um, set up with LMSM's authorization server. So it will log in through here. And from here, this is our home screen. These are the documents that this user has already uploaded. Uh, this is a brand new user, so he has not uploaded any documents. Uh, we go to our upload feature from the camera roll. Uh, we'll select that document there, which is a purchase order. Uh, meanwhile, in the background, this is being parsed by Google Vision. So we can just go ahead and show another feature of our app, which is the camera itself. Um, this would be able to take you know, a picture um, of a real document, and that will be uploaded. Um, the result of that first um, upload is that we have a waybill number and an invoice number. This has been scanned from the document, and there's an X there because it hasn't been matched yet. Um, so now what we're going to do is log in as a seller this time. Um, 
We'll show the, uh, the process of inputting a sales order on the seller side, and we can see how this process kind of goes through. Um, again, he has no documents. He's a brand new user on the seller side. He'll upload another document, the other one, which is his sales order, which is corresponding to the buyer's purchase order. Um, through our mobile app, we can also take multiple pictures. Sometimes orders will have multiple shipping invoices, um, multiple documents that you need to be associating with an order. Um, our apps handle all this. You can bundle all this into one package. Um, we'll treat this as one entire order. And from this, you can extract the certain information that you need, and it'll upload all these documents. Um, in our case, we're not going to do that right now. So we can go back to our, um, our home screen. We can see that up, uh, a document was uploaded. That little check mark denotes that it's been matched with the buyer's document. And we can see that this, this match is almost instantaneous. It was about a one minute process as compared to buyer and seller having to send documents to each other and manually verifying these. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just to sort of reiterate what we just saw, basically there was a buyer and there was a seller and they both inputted their documents into our app. Now once they did that, they were notified of the match in real time, which eliminates this 24 hour delay that we saw previously with all of that manual input. Now what that does is it saves companies a lot of time. And for companies, when you're dealing with time, I mean, every second is valuable and that translates into money. And so we're saving companies money and that's why they'd want to use our app. So after looking at our application, there are several areas where we see that there could be work done. One area is rolling out a text recognition system because as of currently we use Google Cloud Vision, but using our own would allow us to have a finer grain of control over it and be able to optimize for certain aspects of the image we're looking in. Next, we also want to generalize our parser because as of currently, there are many companies out there and our parser only works for several companies. All these different companies have ways, different ways of saying shipping invoice, um, call it document number, or way bill, and documents. So we had to generalize our parser to be able to get a wider scope. And finally, we want to integrate our system with customer enterprise resource planning systems because currently our system only parses the data and notifies the user of a match or not. And if we have an endpoint for these users to actually see what has been matched and what data has been parsed for them, it would be a lot more helpful for them just than knowing that their document has been matched or not. And thank you. And are there any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, how about the error rate versus of you know, the, the text recognition OCR versus human error rate? Seems to me like you, you, know, you could get shipped a whole bunch of stuff you didn't really want if the match didn't work, right? Right, so we haven't done a direct comparison as far as uh, looking into you know, what the error rate is for Google Vision as opposed to inputting it manually. But the idea is that um, as far as that goes, you know, if, if we wanted to expand on it further, what we'd end up doing is basically making it so that if that, the documents didn't match, we could allow for like a, a human input aspect to it. And that's something that Elementum can do um, you know, after they decide to move forward with the project. Kind of a follow-up question on that. Do you have anything to handle returns? Say you got 10 extra items, they accidentally put some extra in there, or maybe 10 of the items they shipped are broken, not up to standards. Is there something like that that continues that relationship between the two? I didn't get the first part of your question. <laughs> so when you're dealing with returns, which unfortunately is a big part of supply chain, um, is there something in your system to handle that side of things? Can you scan a return document in RTV? Uh, I think definitely we can expand on that further, but this is, this is mainly for the purchase order pipeline, so it doesn't really deal with the return aspect of it, which would happen afterwards. Um, it's mainly just to complete the buy you know, from the seller and then get that back. So. All right. If there are not uh, any more questions, then let's thank the speakers, the team again. Thanks, guys. All right. SmartNet with uh, their sponsor, SmartRG, is next.
You guys don't need the audio, right? Hello everybody, we are SmartNet. Uh, I'm Marvin, I'm the team lead. I'm Stefano the Scribe. I'm Krasimir. I'm Angel. I'm Hernan. And this is our Capstone project. We had the opportunity to work with SmartRG this year. Uh, so we all care about the quality of our connection to the internet. Uh, this means that we would hope our router gets set up correctly on the first try. Um, it's also expensive for internet service providers to have to send a technician over to users' home more than once just because the router wasn't set up correctly. Uh, so our solution to this problem is a smart network. A smart network is a mobile application that consists of several diagnostic tools, such as the video stream analyzer, the Wi-Fi speed test, and the Wi-Fi heat maps, each of which allows the technician to make smarter decisions and less mistakes. And so this year, we're pulling upon last year's capstone project. Uh, so what we inherited was a Wi-Fi speed test uh, that's already been done. It's ba like a basic, simple Wi-Fi test you find like on Google. Uh, the Wi-Fi heat map, it's already, there's been some basic functionalities that have already been implemented. And also connecting to a router via Wi-Fi protected setup is basically just you press the button on your router, you press the button on your phone, and it allows you to connect that way. So our goal this year was to port the video stream analyzer to the Android, uh, push the birth certificate to the router. So a birth certificate is a, basically some location data that helps you uniquely identify that specific router. We'll get more on that in the, later on. Uh, the GUI portal, so basically like you'll be able to launch the router's uh, well, launch page right within the app itself, and also improve the heat map features and incorporate more of the router statistics and network statistics into the heat map sheeting algorithm. And I'm going to pass it off to Hernan, who's going to start our live demo with the GUI portal. Hi, everyone. So initially, when the technician arrives to a customer's house, they're going to have to set up the router. And I'm going to set up this router here. And then uh, to set up the router, they have to click, uh, they have to open her, her app and click on the GUI portal, which allows the technician to connect to the uh, router. Uh, they have the option to connect to the router via WPS, uh, which is uh, clicking a button on the router and selecting the first option. Uh, or they can connect manually by viewing the list of available Wi-Fi networks uh, or smart RG Wi-Fi networks. Uh, so uh, when they first go to the house, they're going to see a network called the smart RG setup. And when they connect to that open network, it's going to launch a quick start. And launching, launching that quick start allows the technician to configure a new permanent network with basic functionalities such as uh, Wi-Fi name and password. We have already done that, and our result is uh, Capstone 189. So when we connect to that network, uh, it's going to take the technician to the router's default gateway. And from there, they can uh, do more advanced uh, functionalities such as uh, updating the router's firmware, modifying passwords, or uh, uh, adding firewall rules. Uh, or they can also uh, perform BSA, uh, video stream analysis test, uh, speed test or create heat maps, and now I'm going to pass it on to Krasimir to uh, talk about the heat maps. So once the router is all set up, we're ready to begin running certain diagnostic tools on it. And the first tool that we're going to run is the heat map. So for the heat map, pretty much generates a heat map of the signal strength of the area. So from the main menu, if you go ahead and click heat maps, and then create new heat map, and it's going to bring up a map of your current location. And initially, it's going to drop a pin of your current location on top of the router. And it'll ask the user if this is the correct location. If it's not, you can manually move it to the correct location. In this case, it seems like it did a pretty good job at uh, putting the router pin on top of us. Once the router pin has been dropped, the app will do a quick speed test just from the current location directly to the router. And once that's all set up, you're ready to edit what's called the birth certificate. And Marvin will talk to you more about that. Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, birth certificate is just extra location data just to uniquely identify the router itself. And so uh, if you click on the edit birth certificate button, it'll bring you up to this form. And what it'll do is it'll query our database and to see if there's any existing birth certificate. Uh, if it is, it'll load it. If not, uh, it'll get your approximate location. And so what you can do is basically just edit uh, as you see a fit, so I think this address is good. I'll just type in my apartment number. 
And so when I press done, it will send a copy of it both to the database and to the router itself. That way, uh, any smart RG software or routing algorithms inside the router itself can also access that data. And so once you click that, it will automatically be saved to the back end. And so when you press again, it will load the new data. And that's the birth certificate. I'm going to pass it up to Krasimir to talk more about the heat map. So once all that, that's set up, you're ready to build the heat map for the location. So to do so, you walk around in different locations, drop a pin in the, your current location, and run a speed test with the router. So I'm going to go ahead and walk around right now and run a few speed tests. So I'm running one right now. And what this does is it interacts with the router, and the router gives back certain statistics for, based on the network. These include um, upstream, downstream, uh, tr uh, transmit rates, um, packet loss, jitter, RSSI, etc. And it uses these in, an, in a function and spits out an intensity value. This intensity value is used by um, the heat maps algorithm to d visually display a heat maps of your current location. So in this case, I dropped two pins, and we can see the top left pin is a little red. So maybe that shows that the, that shows that the signal strength there is not so strong. So maybe that signifies that the current location on the router isn't optimal. So maybe we should move the router. So I'm going to go ahead and save this heat map so we can view it later and move the router to a better location. All right. Let's see maybe if this is a better location for the router. So I'm going to go ahead and follow the same process as before. Go ahead and click heat maps, create heat maps. And uh, it's going to be the same process that we just saw. Drop the router pin, do a quick uh, test on the router itself. In this case, we won't have to edit the birth certificate because it's already been saved. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, do the process again of walking around in different locations and running a speed test. So I'm going to run the speed test in this location. It, the, it's going to interact, the um, tablet's going to interact with the router, spit out a certain value, and generate a nice heat map. And it, the reason for the heat maps is it's a very nice visual representation of what is actually uh, the signal strength. So you can easily tell if the signal is good or if the signal is bad. We saw in the previous example that the last pin we dropped was kind of red and didn't have much green in it. Let's see if in this case it's a lot better. We see there's a lot more green. It's uh, covering a, a better area. And so this might be the this is definitely a better location than the previous one, and it might even be the best. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to, oh yeah, I'm going to go ahead and uh, load, load the heat maps right now so you guys can see, again, that the, the difference between the, the two cases. In the first case, we see again the top left, not so much green, a little bit red, a little transparent, so it's not, uh, we can visually see that it's not very good. While in the second case, the, the heat map in the top left, it has a green spot, and, uh, and we can see that it's, it's better. So this was one of the uh, diagnostic tools that we can use to easily see the, uh, the quality of the this, of this signal strength around the house. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Angel. He's going to talk about the visual stream analyzer. So in order to make it easier for ISP technicians to determine a video stream quality in a customer's home, what we did is that we ported a program called the video stream analyzer to Android. And what it does is that it actually shows a lot of useful information in the form of graphs, such as the packets per second, the megabytes per second, and the errors per second. And we actually have a video to show you exactly how the VSA works. So an ISP technician would open the VSA and join a video stream. And what he would see is the packets per second while he's near the router. And what the ISP technician might be interested in doing is actually walking farther away from the router into another room so that he can see how that affects the video stream quality. And what he might see is actually the packets per second dropping, which you'll see in the video right now. And what he would do with this information is probably determine that he needs to place a router somewhere else in the home or place a mesh extender in order to increase the overall quality of the video stream in the customer's home. All right, so we like our app as it is right now. However, uh, we like to add some also some new features to it. And so what we can do is like we can have the app automatically based on the heat map and all the statistics it uses to automatically determine where the best place to put the router is or any best place to put mesh extenders in. And so we think that'd be a really cool feature. So that way the the ISP technician doesn't have to do trial and error and restart the heat map process every single time. And you know it will really put the smart in smart network. And uh, that's our project. Uh, any questions?
All right, any uh, questions for the team? Hi, I guess my main question is like, when you're a technician, would you have to like uh, manually go to all those locations or is it just you pressing down on the Android app and placing the pin there? You'd actually have to walk to those locations because you want to actually get uh, the real data from your actual internet, your, you'll be connected to the uh, internet on your tablet, so you, you want to, you'd want to get the data from that, so you'd actually go to those locations. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks, any other questions? All right, thank you guys. All right, that brings us uh, last but not least to our last team, uh, not our SAC fault that uh, worked together with uh, Nova Coast. All right, hello. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about our project, Authentikey, which is a keyboard biometric solution for multi-factor authentication. Now before we dissect that mouthful, I'm going to introduce who we are. So I'm Alex, I'm team lead. I'm Ashlyn, I'm the team scribe. And that's Kaylin, Will, and Clara. And we're team Nardo Segfault, and we're paired with Novacos, which is a network and security company downtown Santa Barbara. All right, so I just mentioned multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor authentication is the idea that paired with a password on your account, you have another way to authenticate when you go ahead and log in. Now it's important because these days passwords are getting leaked all over the place like candy, right? We saw this with Equifax. So, you know, multi-factor authentication is important, but it's not super easy to do these days. A lot of you are probably familiar with it, right, with like Gmail or Coinbase, where you are prompted, you know, to get a, a you've got a text code sent to, like to your phone, and you've got to type that in after you type in your password successfully. That's great and all, but you've got to have your phone on you connected at all times. You know, so if you need to go ahead and you desperately need to get into account, you know, and you don't have access to all of your, you know, your devices, you're host. You know, you could try and replace a phone with an extra peripheral, like let's say a fingerprint sensor, retinal scan, or facial scanner. And again, that works great if, you know, this peripheral is then integrated in your device and you always have your device with you. But again, that's not always practical, and furthermore, a lot of these sensors and stuff aren't the most accurate, right? So now this is where we come in. All right. So our problem solution is simple. By analyzing the way you type, we can identify who you are. In other words, we're using keyboards. So why keyboards? Well, first of all, they're lightweight. If you're typing in your password, you already have a keyboard in front of you on pretty much any device. You don't need a fancy retinal scanner or a fingerprint scanner on every single laptop you use. It's already there. And secondly, and more importantly, your keyboard biometrics are unique. There are multiple research papers that show that every single person has their own unique typing style. So that can be used to accurately identify who you are. All right, so before we get into the nitty gritty of how Authentikey works, we wanna show you a quick demo that shows the login flow. So basically, I already have an account with our fake website, Cool Cat Photos, and so I'm gonna log in with my username and password, and then I'll be prompted with my Authentikey passphrase. And so before I show you what that looks like, I'd like to invite our randomly selected classmate from uh, Capstone, Ryan. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so Ashen is now logging in with her username and her password. The password for everyone is demo time. And now she's presented with her uh, authenticate typing prompt. 
and logs in and gets her cat photos. And now Ryan, uh, since we just told him the password, is going to log into Ashlyn's cool cat photos, and he'll try. He is presented with the typing prompt, types it in, and he fails. He gets a dog for his for his troubles. So our main product is the Authentic Key API, which uh, websites can use to integrate Authentic Key into their existing login flow. So what can we, they do with this API? First of all, they can train users. So a user registers by typing um, a randomly generated phrase multiple times. And by analyzing how they type that, we can generate a profile that's unique to them and that can be used to identify them in the future. So once we have that profile, um, when they log into that website, uh, they'll be presented with that typing prompt that we just saw. Uh, and so they have to type that in order to be able to log in, and then Authentic Key will uh, analyze how they typed that and we'll use that to verify their identity. So like, say you break your arm or something, your typing style is obviously going to change. So if that happens, you can then retrain your profile so you won't get locked out of your account forever. So let's take a look at how the architecture works. So we have a user who's trying to log into coolcatphotos.biz. We have coolcatphotos.biz and we have our uh, server which uh, is hosting our API. So when a user uh, logs in, they're going to type their username and password. Um, and then if that's correct, uh, coolcatphotos.biz is going to then send a, re a request to Authentic Key saying, hey, what's this user's passphrase? It's going to then display that to the user. The user is going to type that. Uh, and then the typing data is going to get sent to the website, then back to Authentic Key, who is then going to analyze that and then is then going to render a verdict. This is the user or this isn't the user. And then uh, with that knowledge, coolcatphotos.biz can let the user in or they can uh, keep them out of the accounts. All right, so with a project such as this that's so intimately tied to your login, you know, your password, and your account, security is an important concern. So for the scope of our Capstone project, we did as much as we could to make sure that our system was secure. So first off, what that means is our communication channel between our API and any sort of client, you know, their website that uses our API is secure. So at a basic level, you know, we use HTTPS, TLS, and all that good stuff. At a more sophisticated level, it means that we include extra metadata in all of our requests to prevent things like a replay attack, where an attacker um, you know, is able to snoop on the channel, uh, observe the data, and then make a small change to the payload and essentially resend it. Um, but more importantly, though, is that the data is stored securely on our backend server. Now, again, as I said earlier, you know, passwords these days are being leaked like candy. You know, one way you, people can try and um, prevent you know, the, or mitigate the effects of that is to by encrypting the passwords when you store them, by hashing them. Now, that's well and good, but that hashing algorithm does not work for typing data because typing data is in a completely different form and, you know, it's not deterministic in the same fashion. So we had to come up with our own way of storing it securely. And that's not to say we used homebrewed crypto, just rather we got creative with existing standards and methods so that way your data is secure. And again, this is extremely important for typing data because unlike a password, if it gets leaked, you can't change how you type overnight. And then lastly, we have API keys for clients. So this means that a client can only authenticate typing data against users they own. So this would be users who, you know, have registered with their site and registered with authentic key through, you know, like cool cat photos. So this means that uh, a malicious client can't just register with our service and start, you know, authenticating arbitrary keyboard typing data with every user in the database. Um, that being said, you still have to have some inherent level of trust with the site, you know, before you give it your password and some of your typing data. All right, so I'm here to tell you about the results of our testing to examine how well Authentic Key actually works. So before I get into that, I want to talk about how we collected our data and how we tested our data. So if you are a friend or family member of ours, I'm sure you're aware of how we collected it because we sent it out to everybody we could get our hands on. And so basically we had this public facing form. And from that form, you basically had to type the same sentence four separate times. We gave like an assortment of sentences so not everybody got the same one. Once we had all that data, we were able to run it against each other. So those four sentences made a tra training model for each user. And then from there, we were trying to see if each sentence you typed could authenticate yourself and could attackers authenticate as you. So from that, we got over 100 users trained, which means there are 100 people plus willing to type that sentence four separate times, which is great. And then from our testing, we got a 96% true positive rate, which means if you try to authenticate as yourself, you have a 96% chance of doing so, and then 5% false positive rate, meaning that hackers have a 5% chance of authenticating as you. 5% might seem like a lot, but remember this is multi-factor authentication, so 
it's only like the second step, they still have to have that password first. And we know that 100 plus isn't that impressive. We are aware that data collection was kind of a limiting factor, but we think that this is a pretty good proof of concept for the time frame of Capstone. So basically to wrap things up, I'm sure you're well uh, aware of multi-factor authentication. Everybody was talking about it. I'm sure you guys have all used it at some point. So it's very, very common and it is a more secure way to log in. And then biometric solutions right now need that extra peripheral or they need that extra device, which is pretty clunky and the keyboard is already there, so we might as well use it. And one thing we're really proud of as a team is everything was implemented by us. We didn't use like APIs other than NumPy and Django. So the whole authentication process, even our fake website, was all created in-house. And then just to sum up, Authentikey is robust, easy, and secure. Thank you, guys. You have any questions? All right, questions. Thanks. That was a great presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit about the statistical methods that you used uh, to, to do this and whether there's any notion of uh, statistical significance or, or um, guarantee? Um, so it was fairly basic. The uh, testing script that we used was initially just to verify the changes we made to the ML to see if improvements um, you know, were actually improvements. Um, so it was pretty straightforward. We just did kind of a basic um, like true positive calculation, so we would, you know, basically just count the number of times you succeeded, count the number of times, um, you know, attackers accidentally succeeded, and vice versa. And we created kind of your standard totals of, you know, true positives, total positive, false negatives. So we didn't do any fancy statistics beyond that, but the idea was just a good, uh, to get an idea of, you know, how well this worked with the samples that we had. So again, you know, if you've got better data collection in the thousands or millions, you can start doing more significant stats, you know, but that won't really help if you got little data. Um, All right. So have you thought about that attacker can try multiple times, which will significantly increase the, the, the success ratio? So that like an attacker can like spam? So just log in multiple times, uh, try to type in different ways, and uh, try to free your system. Yeah, so, so, there's kind of, so there's kind of two things there. Um, one, you know, this, the typing data that we're uh, capturing is on the order of like a millisecond. So, you know, it's unfeasible that a human, uh, you know, who's shoulder surfing is going to be able to then, you know, attempt even 20 times to try and type by you because it's, it's a little, well, it, that's a lot harder. If you then have a bot, though, that, you know, is trying to emulate spamming, let's say, if you get a password and you're just trying to get past the authentic key, you know, then you're going to have much more success with that. But we can implement things like rate limiting, um, you know, and, and add more checks to how the data gets, you know, transmitted to us. So, you know, security, we tried to get as much as we could, but you could add, you know, extra, like, security to the channel. So, does that make sense? All right. So, I feel kind of bad for asking this because it just happened during your demo, but uh, Ryan mistyped the passphrase. <laughs> so, in the context of the user you're trying to authenticate and the person, like, trying to hack in, um, how do you treat that? Yeah, so the typing data, you know, we take is, um, and we cover this more in depth on the poster, but the typing data we take is, you know, like timings between key presses, um, you know, the amount of time you hold down a key, things like that. So if you do make a mistake, you know, we do exclude um, some of that, uh, some of those key presses from the data because it can be seen as a bit of an outlier, but there's still enough data within that one sentence to get an idea of how his key presses, you know, how long he held down the keys, how fast he transitioned between keys, you know, even when he missed the S in, in sex. Um, so yes, yeah, so you know, if you completely type the sentence wrong, you know, then we do check for that, that's part of the replay attack thing. But if you type it close enough, there's enough data there for uh, us to, you know, get an idea of how well you typed it. And as somebody who's definitely typed their password wrong, um, I can still authenticate usually with just like one miss, like t backspace or something like that too, so. Cool. Um, what machine learning libraries did you use, if any? Uh, we used uh, NumPy, um, and yeah. <laughs> so we, we like, we, 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 so for more context here, uh, you know, we looked at a bunch of papers that were out there that talked about different approaches, statistical and non-statistical methods for, you know, taking in this tapping data, computing distance metrics, and stuff like that. And we essentially kind of schmooshed some of those together and then just used NumPy to do the math. And that's essentially how we came up with our solution. One over there in the back, and then I think I'll have to uh, send the rest to the posters. Sorry, I think it was first. Sorry. 
Um, I think your project is awesome. I was just curious, did you guys find that users have different keyboard fingerprints if they're typing on a mobile keyboard versus a full-size desktop keyboard? So, um, with, with, with one thing first, so the mobile, um, we didn't look into mobile purely for the scope of this project. Um, it's not to say that it would be hard to port it to mobile, just for time reasons. Um, but if you did, yes, you would have to train on a mobile keyboard separate from a desktop keyboard. Um, we found that so long as the keyboard wasn't incredibly different, you know, as in let's say you're used to having, you know, like a whole numpad and stuff, and you have a big fat mechanical keyboard versus a very thin, you know, laptop one, those presented a little bit of, you know, variation, but you're still consistent enough among most keyboards to where you could, you know, go to between Cecil, your home, or something like that and be fine. Oh, um, okay, so I had two questions. How is this better than a fingerprint scanner, which I feel like is standard on like most devices and like laptops now? And also, what's to stop like a keylogger to like emulate the uh, passphrase sentence or whatever it is? Yeah. So, so um, as to how this compares with you know biometric, you know the thing is is if I want to, let's say you go to the library, right? You know, and you want to log into your account with multi-factor authentication in the library. Or you sit down on one of those machines, they're not going to have a fingerprint scanner there, they're not going to have a facial scanner. So, you know, yeah, if you always have your phone on you and, you know, maybe there's that, that can help it, but the idea is that, you know, you never need to worry about having this extra peripheral. And those extra peripherals can also be expensive, too. So if you don't have to buy one, that's great. Um, and then, so what was your second? Mm. Yeah. So, you know, at some level, there, there, you know, there's always going to be uh, some inherent level of trust when you're using a machine. So if you're using a machine and typing your password, and it's key logging, then that might be the first thing you'd worry about. Um, you know, and then beyond that, too, you know, uh, um, if, same thing for, like, a website, right? If you go to a malicious website and you start giving your data, your social security or something, whatever, it doesn't matter whether or not Equifax leaks it, you just gave it away. So, you know, there is some inherent level of trust when you use any service um, when you, you know, give it, like, passwords and data like that. So I think that would kind of be what you'd be think about. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to, thanks to the team again. All right. That concludes the uh, presentation part of the capstone um, um, project part. Um, please, uh, you know, check out the posters for the different teams and uh, have some lunch and come back at 1.30 when we announce the winners of this year's Capstone presentations. Thank you.